to worship. Here I am to bow down. Here I am to say that you're my God. You're all together lovely, all together worthy, all together wonderful to me. Here I am to worship. Here I Before 
the throne of God above. I have a strong and perfect plea, a great high priest whose name is love. Whoever lives and pleads for me, my name is graven. Satan tempts me to despair and tells me of the guilt within. Upward I look and see him there who made an end to all my sin. Because the sinless Savior died, my sinful soul is counted free. For God the just is Righteousness, the great unchangeable I am, the King of glory and of grace. One with Himself, I cannot die. My soul is purchased by His blood. My life is hid with Christ on high, with Christ my Savior and my blood. Savior and my God. Lord, we need a miracle today. Like Jesus changing water into wine at the wedding feast in Cana, we need a miracle. We are tired, Lord, of the hurts of this world. Your steadfast love, like a mighty mountain, will not be moved. Your gifts, as many as the mighty winds, cannot be counted. Your glory, like a mighty torch, will not be put out. Lord, crown us with your love. Show us your glory, that in you, we may be moved to acts of kindness, love, justice, and mercy. Lord, we need a miracle today. Amen. Hi, boys and girls. I'm so happy to be able to talk to you today. A lot of people are sad right now because they are sick or afraid of getting sick. To be able to stay safe, we are not able to do our normal routines, like going to church or school. But I'm gonna pretend, instead of being in my kitchen, that I'm on the steps with you and talking to you today. Do you ever cry? What is something that makes you cry? I made a list of things that make us cry. So raise your hand if you've ever fall down and hurt yourself badly, raise your hand if you've cried when you're so sad. Raise your hand if someone hurt your feelings when you cry. Raise your hand if you ever cried because someone else was crying. We all cry. Do you know that Jesus cried? The Bible tells us that there were several times when Jesus cried. Jesus cried when he saw people were missing out on what God wanted them to do. Luke tells us that he approached Jerusalem and saw the city and he wept over it and said, I wish that even today you would find a way of peace, but now it is too late and the peace is hidden from you. 
Another time, the Bible tells us, Jesus cried was when his friends were hurting. Jesus had a friend named Lazarus who became very sick. He, his sisters, Mary and Martha, sent word to them and said that they would come, please come and heal Jesus. But when he got there, Lazarus was already dead. The Bible tells us that Jesus saw Mary weeping because her brother had died, and he cried too. That isn't all that, that, that Jesus did. Jesus told Mary and Martha and the others to visit the grave where Lazarus was buried. It was a cave with a large stone across the entrance. And they arrived at the tomb. Jesus said to some of the men to move that big stone away then Jesus called out, Lazarus, come out. And Lazarus walked out. Imagine when Mary and Martha saw this. What joy. We all cry. And I'm glad that we have a Savior who weeps too. I am glad that he loves us so much that he hurts when we're hurting. And he feels our pain. And he sees our tears. Let's pray. Dear Jesus, it is comforting to know that when we cry, you cry with us, but it's even more comforting to know that you have the power over death and the grave, and that one day we'll all be in heaven with you, and there will be no more tears in Jesus' name. Amen. request prayers. Um, one of the boys in Brendan's scout troop has a six months old cousin who has just been diagnosed with stage four neuroblastoma. And Lori requests prayers for her dad, Don, who fell and broke his shoulder. Ouch. And Bill, Bill Demeshek, celebrates and requests prayers for his new job starting this Monday. It's closer to home with better pay and benefit. He wants to do it well. Let's continue to pray for Mike Stanley. He has been under the weather uh, for a while, but finally he is getting better. Let's continue to pray for him. And continue to pray for William's cousin, 
out in California, he may have the virus. Dorothy's friend, Mary, who we have prayed for, now went home. Dorothy expresses her appreciation for all the prayers sent on behalf of Mary. Went home meaning went to eternal home. So if you would like to uh, help Dorothy to cope with this situation, please also pray for her. And send me your prayer request um, ahead of time, like everybody else did, uh, via email or text or phone call. That I can include you uh, in our prayer request as well as in my own prayers. Let us pray. This is the season of turning. We are called on this journey to turn our lives to the Lord. It is far too easy for us to sink into the mire of self-pity and self-serving attitudes, wondering why everything isn't coming our way. We want comfort, contentment, no stress, no struggle. Yet our lives are filled with stress and discontent, especially now that we live under such stress due to the virus. How we must try your patience. We want to feel the warmth of your love, the freedom of your spirit, the joy of serving you. Forgive us, Lord. Heal us. We ask your special attention and healing power of the people we lifted before you today. We trust that you are already with them. We ask these things in Jesus' name. Amen. And now we now we pray as our Lord taught us to pray. Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name, thy kingdom come, thy will be done on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread and forgive us our trespasses as we forgive those who trespass against us. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom, the power, and the glory forever. Amen. Now we pray.
or prayers, uh, any uh, music that you would like to share with uh, us together, please feel free to send it to me. I am all ready for this Wednesday, but we can share it, of course, next week. Um, also, if you want to share your own personal stories, short and sweet, then you are welcome to do it. Just let me know. All right? All right. Now, a man named Lazarus was <coughs> ill, who was brother of Mary and her sister Martha. Mary was the one who uh, anointed the Lord with a uh, perfume and wiped his feet with her hair. So the sisters sent a message to Jesus. Lord, he whom you love, ill. But when Jesus heard it, he said, this illness does not lead to death. Rather, it is for God's glory. So that the Son of God may be glorified through it. Although Jesus loved the Lazarus, Mary and Martha, he stayed two days longer in the place where he was. Then after this, he said to the disciples, let's go to Judea again. The disciples said to him, Rabbi, the Jews were just now trying to stone you, and are you going there again? Jesus answered, are there not 12 hours of daylight? Those who walk during the day do not stumble because they see the light of this world. But those who walk at night stumble because the light is not in them. After saying this, he told them, I'm going there to awaken Lazarus. Thomas said to his fellow disciples, let us also go that we may die with him. What loyalty there. When Jesus arrived, he found that Lazarus had already been in the tomb four days. Four days. When Martha heard that Jesus was coming, she went and met him while Mary stayed at home. Martha said to Jesus, Lord, if you had been here, my brother would not have died. But even now, I know that God will give you whatever you ask of him. Jesus said to her, your brother will rise again. Martha said to him, I know that he will rise again in the resurrection on the last day. Jesus said to her, I am the resurrection and the life. Those who believe in me even though they die, will live. And everyone who lives and believes in me will never die. Do you believe this? She said to him, Yes, Lord, I believe that you are the Messiah, the Son of God, the one coming into the world. When she had said this, she went back and called her sister Mary and told her privately, the teacher is here and is calling you. When Mary came where Jesus was and saw him, she knelt at his feet and said to him, oh Lord, if you had been here, my brother would not have died. When Jesus saw her weeping and the Jews who came with her also weeping, he was greatly disturbed in spirit and deeply moved. Jesus began to weep. So the Jews said, see how he loved him. Jesus came to the tomb. It was a cave and a stone was lying against it. Jesus said, Take away the stone. Martha said to him, Oh Lord, already there is a stench because he has been dead for four days. Jesus said to her, Did I not tell you that if you believed, you would see the glory of God? So they took away the stone 
And Jesus looked upward and said, Father, I thank you for having heard me. I knew that you always hear me, but I have said this for the sake of the crowd standing here, so that they may believe that you sent me. When he had said this, he cried with a loud voice, Lazarus, come out. The dead man came out, his hands and feet bound with strip of cloth and his face wrapped in a cloth. Jesus said to them, unbind him. This is a glorious description of the new life found in Jesus Christ. Can you imagine you just shouting at the dead man, dead like four days ago? Lazarus, come out. And can you imagine the people's mind, the drum roll is rolling, and what's going to happen? And the dead man with the strip of clothes actually coming out of the tomb, walking, walking by himself. Jesus so loved Lazarus that he went back to Judea to help Lazarus, even if Jesus was, were trying to, Jews were trying to stone him. That's not all. When he saw Mary and others who were weeping, he wept with, with them. An amazing story, an amazing story. And listen to Paul in his letter to the Romans, chapter 8, verses 6 through 11. He says, To set the mind on the flesh, is death. To set the mind on the flesh is death. But to set the mind on the spirit is life and peace. For this reason, the mind that is set on the flesh is hostile to God. It does not submit to God's law. Indeed, it cannot and those who are in the flesh cannot please God. But you are not in the flesh. You are in the Spirit. Since the Spirit of God dwells in you, anyone who does not have the Spirit of Christ does not belong to Him. But if Christ is in you. Though the body is dead because of sin, the spirit is life because of righteousness. If the spirit of him who raised Jesus from the dead dwells in you, he who raised Christ from the dead will give life to your mortal bodies also. Through this, his spirit that dwells in you. Now, I cannot but ask you this question today. Do you belong to God? Do you belong to God? Do you believe that you are truly a child of God, heir of God? that your brother is Jesus. And Jesus would be weeping with you when you are in pain. And you are worthy to receive the inheritance from your parent God. Do you believe that?
Let's look at the concept inheritance for a moment. Do you remember that the story of prodigal son I shared about a few months ago? Remember when he decided to go come back home after starving to death? Just what he decided to say at the inevitable confrontation with his father? Do you remember that? He had planned to say, Father, I have sinned against heaven and against you. I'm no longer worthy to be treated as your son. So please treat me as one of your hired men. But then when he got there, all his plans, his carefully stripped, script speeches were swept aside and silenced that father would not hear any of them wouldn't even stop to listen but dressed him in a fine robe put a ring on his finger and killed a fatted calf would he have felt comfortable about this arrangement what if he did not want it after all? Suppose that the young, ragged, starved, and thoroughly dejected, never do well, actually wanted, actually preferred to come back in the servant's role. What if his prepared speech was, of all things, completely honest? And that whole idea of sonship was just too much. Far too much for him to handle. And so he wanted a relationship much more limited, much more easily defined. A relationship of duties, tasks, assignments, chores, with appropriate rewards, of course. A relationship that could be somehow be fulfilled and then maybe forgotten. A simple give and take relationship of contract. Yet that father insisted on calling him and treating him as his son. Are we not? Are we not just a bit like that with ourselves? With our heavenly parents? We are saying that we are the children of God, but preferring the lowly role of hired men. Speaking, seeking, like one. Seeking for ourselves a tidy, neat, and well-defined religion. A set of clear, concise requirements that we can handle. And we'll guarantee the promise of eternal life when what God is looking for is a child, a son or daughter, heir. Someone to relate to. Someone who will grow into a partner. With whom to share the family farm with all its huge responsibilities. Huge possibilities. That's what the faith holds out to us. This transition from the hired hand the heir of absolutely everything. And we, we hold back. Do we not? We linger in the valleys of self-doubt and shrinking timidity. We say that we don't deserve this. Not that we have done something terribly wrong. It's just that we are not ready for it yet. There's too much to be taken care of first. And it could be just too much to handle. Nothing is free. So our faith becomes to us a duty. 
another task, another burden to carry, assignment to be met, in hopes that somehow we can earn our way into God's heart. And we cannot see that in doing this, we are rejecting everything God offers us. We are saying to the breathless father who has waited and waited by watching the long and dusty road up to the farm for, for our return of these many years and then has come racing down and smothering all our empty apologetic phrases about earning our way back with his arms around our neck, his tears upon our face. And we say to him, oh, oh please take back, take back your robe, this ring, this fatted calf is just, just too heavy. It's just too much. It gives too much. Ask too much. I'd, I'd rather do this on my own, at my own speed. As much as I feel comfortable to do. So we resist. We resist God's call to move from slavery to the role of child and heir, from fear to freedom. Yet we still cling to those fears. Here is Paul, a prisoner of Rome, or about to become one bitten in one city, stoned by the mob in another, shipwrecked, wandering homeless, often ill, seriously, suspected and accused even by his fellow Christians. And he can say, I consider the suffering of this present time are not worthy to be compared with the glory that is to, that is to be revealed in us. And Paul can say, in all these things, we are more than conquerors through him that loved us. For I am persuaded that neither life nor death can separate us from the love of God. And he can say, if the spirit of him who raised Jesus from the dead dwells in you, he who raised Christ from the dead will give life to your mortal bodies also through his spirit that dwells in you. While we spend our days in timidity and fear, forever worrying about finances, worrying about illness and old age, with all its cost, worrying about relationships, worrying about wars and crime, mass shooting, disease, hurricane, earthquake, and terrorism, worrying about coronavirus, which tops among everything lately. What a fearful, yes, a terrorized time we are living in. Jesus says, come out, come out. Don't stay there in your own cave. Don't be afraid. Don't be afraid. Just drop that fear. Come out. Just set your mind on the spirit the life set there before us for the living, eternal life beginning here and now. In acts of love and deeds of trust, the building of God's kingdom of justice and peace. And instead, we choose to just exist 
to drag ourselves along from day to day, ear to ear, claiming to believe and yet not living it, calling on the Lord and yet not loving him, seeking a small candle when the night grows dark rather than his steady beaming sunlight leading toward eternity. When it comes to that amazing grace, because duties we can handle, we've grown up with those, they are part of who we are. But freedom, complete forgiveness, no condemnation whatsoever. Well, who can live in a world like But that's, but that's just the point. That's just the point. You can, I can, we can. If only we are bold enough to refuse to accept a world like this. And to refuse to accept the fear that pressing us down. You did not receive the spirit of slavery, says Paul, to fall back into fear. But you have received the spirit of adoption, of son and daughtership, so that you can cry, Abba, Father. Do you hear what Paul is saying? that our parent God has wrapped about our shoulders the rich red robe of his forgiveness. That our parent God has slipped upon our fingers the golden ring that seals our future, binds it with his own. That our parent God has killed the fatted calf sacrificed his own son, our Savior, Jesus Christ, so that we might see and know his love and feast upon his mercy. And that God, that God calls us now not to worry about things around us, but just walk in the light walk in the light with confidence and the God gently whispers into our ears at this time not shouting whispering into our own ears Lazarus Jisong Barry Chris come out and join me at my table, this family table set for all the earth, and there to eat and drink, make merry. Come out, come out my daughter, my son, my child, come out and take your place as heirs of the kingdom. It is our turn to accept God's call. It is our turn to accept God's gift and live confidently, confidently as the living creature of God's kingdom. Let us pray. Lord, grant to us the courage of our own convictions. Teach us how to accept your gift of life 
and then to live it fearlessly and faithfully and joyfully. In Christ we pray. Amen. It is our time to praise God again. What wondrous love is this? Let us sing together verse 1 and 4. you to bear witness to hope and goodness. Go forth with God's love and blessing to bring good news to this hurting world. Amen. <laughs>